All right, we're in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, starting at verse 17, and our subject is reflecting God's glory. Now, in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and 4, Paul is speaking about God's glory. In fact, he actually uses the word glory no less than eight times. Now, do look at 2 Corinthians 3, 17. Now, the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we who with unveiled faces reflect the Lord's glory are being transformed into his likeness with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. So notice that the goal of our lives is to reflect the Lord's glory. And that tells us something else, doesn't it? And that is that we therefore have no glory of our own. All we can ever do is to reflect, reflect his glory. In Solomon's song, chapter 6, verse 10, the church, and it's describing the believers, the church is described as, have, as being as fair as the moon. And of course, like the moon that has no light of itself, it can only reflect the sun. But, but what does the sun represent? Well, in Malachi, chapter 4, verse 2, the Godhead is compared with the sun saying the sun, and that's not the S-O-N, but the S-U-N, the sun of righteousness will rise with healing in his wings. So this, the orb of day is likened to the Godhead. So as far as we're concerned, what we're being told here is that God's light, God's truth, God's glory is all borrowed from God. All we can do, all we are supposed to do is to reflect it. Let me give you an example of this. John chapter 1, starting at verse 6. Now, this is speaking about John the Baptist, the forerunner of Jesus, who was to pre prepare the way for Jesus. There came a man who was sent from God. His name was John. He came as a witness to testify to that light, to reflect Christ's light, so that through him all men might believe. He himself was not that light. He came only as a witness to the light. John the Baptist's calling in that respect is every one of our callings. And that is not to come up with any new light ourselves, no truth, no, no, no new philosophy. That's not our purpose. It's merely to reflect his truth, to reflect his glory. So how do you reflect God's glory? Notice verse 18. And we who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory, are being transformed into his likeness with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord. Uh, and, 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 and when you look at that, you, you notice that there's a very simple order. And that is, the glory first has to come from the Lord, and only then, secondly, can we reflect it. So the question is then, how do we obtain it from the Lord so that we can reflect it? Follow this. Psalm 34, verse 5, it's a very interesting verse. I just happened to come across it, and I think it really un unveils this. It says, I sought the Lord, said David, and he answered me, and he delivered me from all my fears. And then he adds, by way of summary, those who look to him are radiant. Which means, and those who look to him are also radiant. So how did he look to Christ? He said, I sought the Lord. And he answered me. That's how he looked to Christ. So those who habitually seek God, who look to Christ, are what? Those who look to him are radiant. That is, they reflect the Lord's glory and are being transformed, he said, into his likeness. So consequently, our entire life's purpose is to seek God, is to focus our attention on Christ because, we're told, what we focus on is what will transform you. It's what you will reflect in your life. So if you go through life and you're always focused on your fears, you're going to reflect anxiety and gloom. Uh, if all you do is what a lot of people do is focus on what it is you don't have, well, you're going to reflect covetousness and discontent. Now. If, however, you focus on the blessings that you do have, your whole life will reflect thankfulness. 
At the other extreme, if you're habitually focused on attempting things, then you will reflect sinfulness in your lifestyle. Well, if you can follow that very simple logic, you can see that you cannot possibly reflect God's glory unless your life is focused on God, unless it's focused on his glory, that is focused on his person, uh, focused on his provision, unless you're doing what David does, was doing, and that is to seek him, to look to him, to be dependent upon him. Why is that? For it is those who look to him who are radiant. So we all know this because we've mentioned it many times, but uh, everything God ever created, he, re he created for one purpose, and that was to reflect his glory. Why would he aim at something less than that? Uh, Psalm 19 verse 1 tells us the heavens declare the glory of God. Something interesting that not everybody knows is that God's enemies, to, to their final horror under God's sovereign providence, will actually have ended up having glorified God. How is that possible? Romans 9.17 says, For the scripture says to Pharaoh, I raised you up for this very purpose that I might display my power in you and that my name might be proclaimed that is glorified in all of the earth. Well, if even sinners under God's sovereign hand will end up glorifying him, if the birds of the, of the trees and creation and the fields and, and everything else reflects God's glory, well, you could be sure that those who are created in the new creation, those who are born again, those who are children of God, were also created for one purpose, and that is to reflect his glory. Uh, in Isaiah 43, verse 7, God says, Everyone who is called by my name, I created for my glory. And when you look at the great saints, whether they be the great saints of the Bible or whether they be the great saints in history or some marvelous believer that, that you had the good fortune to come within the circumference of, you will notice there's a common denominator on them, and that is their life's focus was on who God is, was on God's glory, reflecting it right to the very end. In fact, let me read you the last dying words of some of them. Uh, William Carey, the great missionary to India, his last words were, when I'm gone, do speak less of Dr. Carey and more of Dr. Carey's savior. <laughs> Glorify him, not me. Susanna Wesley, who is the mother of John and Charles Wesley, she said in her last dying breath, children, when I'm gone, I want you to sing a praise to God. First thing I want you to do is glorify God. Edward Perronet, who is a pastor, his last words were, glory to God in the height of his divinity, glory to God in the depths of his humanity, glory to God in his all-sufficiency. Into his hands I now commend my spirit. Joseph Everett, he said, glory, glory, glory. And then he repeated this for 25 minutes and only ceased when his life ceased. A lovely, a lovely way to go out, eh? Uh, Dr. John MacArthur was in his first year of ministry and he preached a series on the glory of God, which actually inspired a book of the same subject. And after which he said to his wife, and I quote, I'm now ready to go to heaven because I have discharged my soul on the most important subject that I will ever speak on or ever write on. There's only two kinds of people that will stand before God on the day of judgment. And the first kind are those that glorified him, who can say what Jesus said to the Father in John 17, verse 4, and that is, I brought you glory while I was on this earth. The second group are those that never glorified God. Described in Romans 1.21, when they knew God existed, they did not glorify him as God. One group will be eternally blessed, the other group will be eternally condemned. And you say that seems so severe. Why is that? Well, Psalm 8 verse 1 says, O Lord, O Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Because the most important thing in the entire universe is that God be glorified. 
and to live a life where you were created for his glory and you actually refuse to glorify him is the reason. So how can we reflect God's glory? Well, as we've seen, you have to behold God's glory first in order to reflect it, which is why you can see that sinners cannot possibly reflect God's glory as they're supposed to because they can't behold it. They can't see it. 2 Corinthians 4, 4 says, The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see what? What is he trying to blind them from so that they cannot see? So that they cannot see the gospel of the glory of Christ who is the image of God. So what has to happen? Well, he goes on to say, For we do not preach ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as servants for Jesus' sake. So right there he says, the first thing they're going to need is they need to hear the gospel of the glory of Christ. Then he adds, then God who said, let light shine out of darkness, referring to Genesis when God created the whole universe in the first place by speaking it into existence and said, let there be light. He's going to, in order to recreate a person, he has to do this. He's going to do the same thing and he'll say, let light shine out of darkness to give us the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So what does spiritually dead, blind sinners need? They cannot see anything great in, the gospel, in, in, in Jesus Christ. Is they first have to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that is his identity. That the member of the Godhead came to the earth with a purpose. And what was his mission? Is to go to the cross, was to bear their sin to bear the punishment for it in their place so that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have, have everlasting life. And even then, there's something else they need. And he mentions it here. God has to speak sovereignly into their heart and say, let light shine out of darkness. He has to create, God has to create in their hearts light to shine in their hearts. Or as he puts it, to give them the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. He has to sovereignly do that. You see an example of this in Acts chapter 16, verse 14, where it says God opened Lydia's heart so that she could respond to the sermon. What happens when we behold for the first time the glory of God? We catch a glimpse of it. God grants us the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Well, the, the, the corresponding thing that has to happen is, is you see something of the glory of God as you begin to see something of your own sinfulness leading to an acknowledgement of Jesus as Lord, to leading to repentance. And so, uh, Philippians 2.11 says that every tongue that confesses that Jesus Christ is Lord will do so to the glory of God the Father. On the other hand, the other extreme, Revelation 16.9 talks about those who refused to repent and give God the glory. So what happens first? First of all, the conversion of sinful people brings great glory to God. Psalm 106 verse 8 says, God saved them for his name's sake. That's another way of saying God saved people for his own glory. You ever thought about that, that God gave his life, that he was willing to die in your place because he loved you, but mainly in order to bring glory for himself. Now, many of you know the story of the mutiny on the bounty. Following the rebellion of the notorious Captain Blythe, nine mutineers with uh, a number of Tahitian men and women who had accompanied them, they found their way on Pitcairn Island in 1790. They started doing exactly what Noah did when he got out of the ark, as he started dis they started distilling alcohol. Ten years later, the drunkenness and the fighting left only one man alive, and that was John Adams, and, and of course the, the natives on the island. By and by, John Adams found the ship's Bible, and he began to read it. And he was so changed by it that he started teaching it to the natives. 
When Pitcairn Island was discovered 18 years later by the USS Topaz, they reported that Pitcairn Island is a prosperous community with no jail, with no crime, and that nearly every person on the island is a professing Christian to God's glory. The conversion of sinful people brings God great glory. Then, when converted believers live a life of thankfulness to God, God is further glorified. Now, in these two chapters, where he's talking exclusively about reflecting God's glory, he, he literally goes on a verbal monologue without intermission about being thankful. I, I can't even, it, it would be here too long if I went through all of it, but let me just deal with chapter 3. In chapter 3, <clears throat> He thanks God for the gospel of God's grace, verse 7 to 11, for the hope that we now have, verse 12, for, for God enlightening us with the truth in verse 14 to 16, for the freedom that we now have in Christ, verse 17, and then he thanks God for the fact that God is daily transforming us into his image, verse 18. That's just in chapter 3. Colossians 3, 17 says, whatever you do, whether it's word, in word, whether it's in deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God through him. Psalm 86, verse 12, I give thanks to you, listen to this, I give thanks to you, O Lord my God, with my whole heart, and I will glorify you forever. Well, did he change topics? No. Thankfulness is glorifying God. It's one and the same thing. It's not just how you glorify God, it is glorifying God. George Matheson, who is a well-known blind preacher in Scotland, he wrote his, a prayer down that I guess he wanted his children to, uh, to read one day. He said, my God, I, I've never thanked you for my thorn, meaning his blindness. I, I've thanked you for my roses many times, thousands of times but never once for my thorn. Teach me the glory of my cross. Teach me the value of my thorn. Show me that I've climbed to thee by the path of pain. And show me that my tears have made a rainbow for you to see. When, you, when I read that, I think of the man in John chapter 9, the man who was born blind, that Jesus said of him, speaking of his blindness, this happened so that the work of God might be displayed in him. This, this happened, this suffering happened so that a rainbow might be displayed over his life for God to, to, to look at, to take pleasure in. And here's a question I was asking myself as, as I was coming across this, is can I thank God for my trials? Can I thank God for... Uh, my infirmities? Can I thank God for, for the trauma that God put me through at a period in my life? And, and I'm speaking for all of us here, knowing that God has ordained that so he could put a rainbow over you for him to take pleasure in, for his glory, for his pleasure, whether I understand it or not. Okay, so how do you get to the place where you can thank God for your trauma? How, how, do you, how do you get to that? Well, that takes us from living a life of thankfulness to glorify God to keeping your eyes on the one who suffered for you. That's how you do it, and that's how you glorify God. Hebrews 12, 2 says, Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. And you do that, it says, consider him so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Now, if you look at chapter 4, go down to verse 17. Remember, he's continuing his discussion about reflecting God's glory. He says, for our light and momentary troubles. See, that's what happens when you look at Christ on the cross, what he did for you. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory, still speaking about God's glory, that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, what is unseen is eternal. 
what Hebrews, we just read, calls fixing our eyes on Jesus who died for you. You want to glorify God? Uh, you've got to live a life of thankfulness. You cannot live a life of thankfulness even for your scars, even for your trauma, if you keep an eye on what the Lord Jesus went through for you. You know, when we read of worship in heaven, you wonder, what's it going to be like? Well, we, have, we know what it's going to be like because the Bible tells us. In Revelation chapter 5, verse 12 to 13, we read that they will be, and I quote, saying with a loud voice, now listen to what they're saying, worthy is the Lamb who was slain. That means slain, who was slain for me. Worthy is he to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. In heaven, all their thankfulness, all their joy is, is coming from the fact that they're still keeping their eyes focused on the lamb that was slain for them. Some of you who know your Bible history know that Cyrus was the leader of the Persian Empire. He, one time, at one occasion, arrested a nobleman's family. And then Cyrus asked the nobleman, what would you give if I released your children? And he said, I'd, I'd give everything I own. Then he said, well, what, what would you give if, if, if I released your wife? And then in tears, he said, I, I'd give myself. And Cyrus was so moved by this gentleman that he just let the whole family go. Well, as the family were returning home, the nobleman turned to his wife and he said, you notice that Cyrus, what a handsome guy that is, he was, he is. And she replied, I didn't notice. I, I could only keep my eyes on you, the one who is willing to die for me. First, the conversion of sinful people brings great glory to God. Then secondly, when that converted person lives a life of thankfulness. And third, when that believer keeps his eyes on the one who died for him, God is glorified. And, and, and finally, what do these three things accomplish in a person's life when they're living this way? He tells us we become transformed into the image of Christ. And that ultimately glorifies God. Verse, chapter 3, verse 18 again. And we with unfailed faces all reflect the Lord's glory, are being transformed into his likeness with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Now, may I say, we need to discuss that, because what does that mean, transformed into his likeness? This has been the most appalling misunderstanding of what that means throughout history. Uh, some people think, well, it, it means that I'm now got to become much more religious. I've got to become unbearably critical. Uh, I, I, I've got to assume the characters, character of the Pharisees who look down all others that they consider to be less perfect than they are. How, how many religious people function that way? Well, of course, it means to become like Jesus with all of his attributes which is another sermon, another sermon series, uh, another lifetime of sermons. But, but, but even then, becoming like Jesus doesn't mean that you lose your identity. Because 1 Corinthians chapter 12 says that God made every single one of us completely different, gave us completely different gifts and skills, so that Galatians chapter 6 verse 4 could say, each one then can test his own actions so he can take pride in himself without comparing himself to somebody else, for each man should carry his own load. Meaning that each person is uniquely gifted to accomplish his own mission, that is, his, carry his own load, by which he is to glorify God. You, you don't have to be somebody else. I think there's so many preachers I pay attention to have a catalog of gifts that I, I never will have. I think of my own handicaps, and God said, oh, yeah, you've got everything you need to do your little gig. You can't be these other people, and you don't have to be. You don't have to compare yourself with them. 
Well, this is, this is, this is, this is a liberty. You know, at the close of a service in the 1800s, a critic approached D.L. Moody, who was an old, was just an old country boy, but he was also one of the world's great evangelists. And this is what he said to him after the service. And I quote, Mr. Moody, during your address this evening, I counted 18 mistakes in your English. Looking at his critic, Mr. Moody said, young man, I'm using to the glory of God all the grammar I know. Are you doing the same? So let's sum this up. Now that you're saved, decide today you're going to live a life of thankfulness and you're going to start thanking him for the worst things that ever happened to you. Now, how am I going to do that? Well, you're going to accomplish that by keeping your eyes on the person and the worst thing that happened to him is it's him suffering and dying for you. Because whatever you went through, you can be sure you went through for him. He wouldn't have put you through otherwise. And whether you appreciate it or not, there's a, he appreciated the rainbow that he created out of your tears. Somehow it counts for the kingdom of God. And in so doing, if you can just do that, be thankful, keep your eyes on Jesus and the cross, then you're going to be continually transformed into the image of Christ and you'll be able to represent him in your own unique way with your own set of gifts. And guess what your life's going to count for? It's going to beautifully reflect God's glory. Amen. Let's pray.